Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 52. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, extracting the signal noise, the Cube, Silicon Angle, Cube Research. Dave, one year in, 52 weeks of straight podcasting. One year? I think this is our missed, anniversary? I think we missed one week, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We did I, it. I think we're in the top 10 in the, in the overall tech industry. I'll have to go check the rankings on, on uh, Apple iTunes. But yeah, we're rising right up the charts. Oh, it's good to be with you, John. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, plenty of news. Obviously, uh, it's a couple things going on. We're in my March Madness, rooting for the Carolina. My daughter's senior there, UNC. Um, big upsets in the, in the March Madness. Bracketology. Um, SBF is going to jail for 25 years. And uh, that's the huge news. Obviously, Databricks announces a potent open source LLM called DBRX. And big money, Amazon pulled the trigger on their next tranche of their four billion dollar investment, Anthropic. I think they're they're adding another two point seven five billion into Anthropic. Uh, Cohere gets a five hundred million. Jeremy Burton, Cube alumni, raises one hundred fifteen million in Series B. Intel, Samsung, Qualcomm all form this UXL foundation to take on Nvidia's CUDA software. Okay, and else also you know the AI officer role. Is in is in in flux. We talked to Cisco and a bunch of other people working on their AI strategies. It's clear that an AI officer is coming down the pike. And of course, you know, we've been at a bunch of different events. We've been covering EC Connect, Adobe, um, all the different events, and uh, Google Cloud's coming up. So we're about to slide into heavy duty season for the Cube. Uh, obviously, all the hot enterprise tech events uh, will uh, start. Trickling in, like I said, we coupled a couple of events this week. We got Google Next, cloud events coming. Just a ton of activity. I think April, May, and June are going to be like literally nonstop for us and our team. We're going to be packed and uh, there's so much more action. I mean, every day it's like, I feel like I'm getting behind every day. It's like, oh, damn, I got to dig into the, the model of experts, MOE, the new thing everyone's talking about, the MOE. I didn't have that on my uh, bingo card, as they say this week in the news, but Databricks, you know, brings up this MOE, this model of experts concept to the LLMs, but faster, smaller, cheaper. This is the kind of a movie we've seen before with AI right now and Databricks. I love the open source, open angle on this because this is going to be a, um, a, a boom for developers. You're going, We're going to see the beginning of a more of accelerated speed game, how people are using LLMs, using AI. I was just reading a paper just today on how uh, academics are using the LLMs for peer review. You know why? Because it's more polite than peer review. <laughs> 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 they write incoherent papers. So, you know, research model. I mean, everything's being impacted, but uh, it should be um, a great event season as we go into year two of the Cube Pod and also kind of year two of the AI hype, Dave, where the consumer will lead the market. You're going to start to see enterprise start to put stakes in the ground. And it's going to be the year of you know, put the steak, show the steak on the grill. If you get the sizzle, you better show the steak, as they say. So it's going to be the year of open up the cover and let's see how the steak looks. Who's got yeah. the beef? That's going to be the question this year. Who's got no, the we're beef 16 in months AI? In, right? 16 months yeah. into the, to the AI wave. A lot, yeah, of, sizzle, a lot of sizzle, Dave. A lot of sizzle. Where's well, the steak? I, I thought that Databricks announcement was pretty sizzly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they made a lot of claims. I, I mean, you were saying, I mean, I looked at it and said, wow, so much for small language models. I know it's 36 billion parameters, but but they, that they it, you, they use out of 132 billion. But that still feels pretty big to me, John. I mean, um, and, you know, you just, I think, as we were coming on the Q-Pod, you said somebody else just le leapfrogged. Sam Samba Nova Systems out of Palo Alto just announced their COE region 0 0.2 outperforms DBRX. Um, and uh, with Databricks is, and Mistral and Grok, okay, um, at a breakneck speed of 330 tokens per second. Um, again, this is just the breakthrough speeds without sacrificing precision is going to be the key. And it's going to come down to this whole, you know, what will AI run on? That's the big enterprise battle. So, you know, remember we used to use the NASCAR analogies. You'd like to say horses on the track. I use the NASCAR analogy. All the cars are kind of in a cluster. Someone gets ahead, someone slingshots out front. I think we're going to see a lot more of this where it's going to be an arms race in AI like we've never seen before 
We've seen arm races before where people, whoever can get out there out front will win. But you're starting to see a technical arms race and a financial arms race. You're seeing the investment community going all in. Even in spaces like observability, Jeremy Burton, we mentioned Observe got $115 million in a Series B, which is a good Series B round, but that's a very tight market observability. So he's betting that they're going to be they're going to have a war chest of funds to propel themselves in into the position to be in the pack. Whatever yeah. analogy you want to use, NASCAR, you know, Saturday moving day in the Masters, you want to be in the hunt. If you're not in the hunt, you're going to be left out. I think this is what we're seeing right now in AI. On G on Jeremy's raise, it looked like to me like he didn't do the typical, you know, Jeremy's got wisdom. He's been around a while. He didn't do the typical try to maximize the valuation. I think he tried to maximize his balance sheet and his runway and create a an attractive deal for investors. That's the way it looked to me. Um, but I wanted to come back to DBRX if we could for a second. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it was, it was, I, I started to dig into it and I'm just sort of getting into, I was, I was going to do it for my breaking analysis tomorrow, but it's like tomorrow's good Friday. I kind of want to leave early and do the stations if I can. But, um, but so I got to pick an easier topic, but the, so, so the question is, so they've made a big deal out of being open source, but I was started to read the licenses. I don't usually read these open source licenses, there's some stuff in there, John, that is pretty interesting. Let me share some of it with you. Yeah. I, I mean, found I got, um, but on Twitter, by the way, they were commenting on this. So go ahead. That was, well, so that's comment. where I saw it. And I was like, hmm. Somebody said it's not really open source. And I'm like, well, well, why not? So let's go read the license and see. So I found a few things that I think are worth discussing. And yeah, you know, maybe it's okay, but I'd love your thoughts. So it says um, all distributions of DBRX or derivatives must be accompanied by a notice text file that contains the following notification, quote, DBRX is provided under and subject to the Databricks open model license, copyright Databricks, Inc., all rights reserved. So I'm like, mm, that kind of caught my attention. That was one. And then it said if on the release date of DBRX, if the monthly active users of the platform you're applying it to are more than 700 million, you can't use the model without Databricks permission. So that's what bite dance, I guess. And and, and Meta, and it also says you can't use DBRX to improve other LLMs. So that's kind of restrictive. And, and essentially I found another clause that looks like they're maybe not hardcore about it, maybe they won't enforce it, but but forced model updates, you gotta be the most current. And I can see why they do that. If if an earlier version is deficient, they don't want it out there, but, but so I guess it's open in the sense that it's not a black box, the weights are open. But I don't think the training data is has been revealed. And I think just I, I don't know what other open source licenses look like. I got to dig into it. But these three or four things caught my attention. Yeah. And I was like, huh, maybe it's like quasi open. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, um, it's a great call out. And I got that. So that same tweet might have been hitting us both on that one. But I think it's a really um, important point. This is a new era. I and mean, if you looked at what Jensen Wong said at NVIDIA's GTC and all the coverage we've been doing with AI, everything points to this new generative model is new. So if you combine, I call classic open source licenses, they've been under siege lately. You've seen what happened with MongoDB, you got HashiCorp, even Redis recently have changed their licenses all to, they all to get commercialized. And that's yeah. caused all kinds of forking. So just generally speaking open source is upside down on the licensing anyway right so mattis has been very vocal on this on info world his call and then on silicon angle so you have this pure open source model the commercial open source as it becomes more entrepreneurial and there's this wealth to be created happening and then enter this llm stuff which in and of itself is kind of like code I mean, data, as I've always said, is like software. It's like code. So when you start looking at LLMs, you, you almost got to look at them like code bases. They're not code bases in the classic sense of software code, but they're, they are um, code in the sense of they are it's data and it's got value. Like software used to have value in a proprietary sense. So you, how do you apply an open source concept to data that is constantly changing, right? So it's a very tough licensing call because one, it's never been done before. Then you got to sit down and figure out, one, what's the future going to look like for the data as it evolves? Number three, what's the best license to apply to it? So these are a lot of unknowns. So my first reaction was, 
you play it down the middle of the fairway and see what happens. That's the way I see this going on. So I'm not too concerned about the license. I think it's more of a hedge from Databricks not to get into trouble yeah. and play it straight down the middle and say, let's see where it goes. I think it's an opportunity. I think what should happen is uh, a team of people in the industry should form a little collective council or open source kind of vibe or and just figure it out. Uh, I'm not deep enough on the licenses to understand the nuances between what on the data side, but you know, to me, you know, I can see someone saying, I don't want to do all this, let this work get get pulled and strip mined into someone else's model. So yeah. there's gonna be a game of thrones going on in around this area. So again, the contributions are gonna be like we beat you, and it's gonna be the arms race. And then you got this license under the covers. And and then by the way, who owns it? So what if they're mixing in uh data that's owned by somebody? So it's a can of worms to begin with in a good way. That's what innovation looks like. It's not pretty. It's not always tight. It's kind of ugly. And as they say, it's sausage making in the early days of these big waves. So I yeah, love I, what Databricks did. And I think the way they handle themselves um, over the past two couple of years, they've been good at managing some of these open models, especially how they handled uh, uh, all that stuff when opening up the data formats last year. So um, they have a track record. So I, I kind of trust Databricks on this one. Well, so, yeah, and I couldn't find anything about the, the training data set as to whether or not that's open, but I, so I presume it's not been revealed. And this this came out of the Mosaic ML acquisition, right? And they were, did you see the benchmarks? Did you see the, it looks like the graphs were kind of thrown together. Like I was, you know, maybe I'm being a little bit too pedantic, but like the the 71% graph for Mixtrol was under 70% or whatever it was. It was just, they weren't lined up. It was like sort of maybe rushed a little bit, but I do a lot of crappy slides too. So I really can't. Well, I, Rob, Rob Hoff and, and Paul Gillen wrote that because Rob went to the dinner and had the briefing, but I think I read on, on Twitter, I was talking to Ali and um, Naveen on, on Twitter around some messaging back and forth when they announced it. I, I, the guy who did the graph spent all, pulled an all nighter. He had to get him out. <laughs> I've so, been there. I, I mean, uh, I've been there. So I, mean, I can't. That's but cut, cut him some slack on that. But I know, totally. Like, but it was just like yeah. it. It just was interesting to see. But it's a you know just looking at it. Some of the benchmarks. It's like two and a half si times the size of of Mixtro, with about you know half the inference speed. So it's like mm, okay, and I don't know. I, I don't know how much to to put into these you know the bench marketing. But then I was thinking, all right, well. What is, how does this fit with Databricks business? And I think it sits on top of Databricks and they're basically saying, look, bring your data, bring your machine machine learning, bring your gen AI, we'll rag it, we'll bring vector search to it. And and I think, I think their play is to sell DBUs, right? That's what Databricks sells, Databricks units, which are some opaque, at least to me, Databricks processing unit, and they sell a crap load of them and uh, they'll probably do really well with this. So that, uh, that's kind of how I looked at it. And it's, yeah. I guess it's a pretty good play. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's, it was, I think trained, I read it was trained on 12 trillion tokens, which is yeah you know, a lot more than like. Well, like the, the large has got 130 billion, 32 billion parameters. And, and it's the design is around the MOE model of expert architecture. And it switches between which experts uh, pieces to go with in the code. That's the key innovation. So it's designed to work in a very low compute footprint, which we've been talking about LLMs being optimized for say edge devices, um, whether that's cameras on an intersection or a human wearable device or a small machine in a, in a retail store, it doesn't matter. It's like, it's a, it's a non data center um, device. So you start to see that. I think that's something that we said from the phone to the handheld human wearable to sensor on a network to a light pole all this is going to be low low footprint size well and but it was trained on 12 trillion tokens but i think you're right it's the sort of mixture of experts is, is how they did it but you compare that to like falcon i think was trained on three and a half trillion tokens the falcon 180 yeah. so it should be substantially better right yeah. um but anyway well, it's what it's I love a good about marketing well, well, first of all, Databricks is great because they have a lot of cash, got a lot of smart people, and they pull a lot of talent into the company. If you look at how they handle their projects, they're doing good with on the talent side. But what's what this really proves to me is that continuing to validate the developer market right now is so hot. Right now, these companies want these developers using their tools, and we've seen 
in the cloud native wave that whichever developer adoption wave hits, those companies around those tool chains are extremely successful. So if you look at all the public companies that went on past decade, all were adopted either organically and or because they had a great product for developers. So as the infrastructure players like Databricks, Amazon, Google, all try to win over that infrastructure, we saw Broadcom having chips and we have NVIDIA wants to be this big data center. The infrastructure is building out as fast as it possibly can for the picks and shovels and the platforms and tools because the developers are hungry for the best. And um, Databricks is doing this to get the developers hooked on their, their uh, products and services. Yeah, um, they're not dumbasses. I mean, I think they recognize that slow outputs are a problem. It's funny, John, right? Remember we were to, when we were talking to, uh, we were in the private meeting with Jensen for a couple hours last week. He said, well, imagine if you could let the AI go off for a week, which is yeah. kind of interesting. But at the same time, we know users want instant gratification. So I think Databricks recognizes that that slow getting getting to an outcome slowly is a problem and they're addressing that and they're saying, Did, run this on our stack. So it's, it's interesting. The data business is like databases. It's, it goes through all these cycles. It's got a query response. But what, uh, what I think Jensen said that in our private meeting, as you pointed out, was interesting is that the world that we lived in prior to Gen AI was programmed for us, even databases. You type a query, you get a response. Um, and so that was kind of a static world. Now it's completely generating at runtime, generate a response. But but what I liked about his talk was, he said AI will fill two use cases. The prompt response model, type a query in like ChatGPT and get a generated response. That goes from basic text prompt to multimodal, some sort of runtime assembly response. And then he said, send it away to go reason. So there's two use cases, prompting and responding and generating at runtime, and then go away and think. That's reasoning. So all the big conversations now in AI that's happening inside the ropes in the industry is this whole reasoning aspect is huge. And it's the number one thing that nobody's talking about that's the hottest thing. Ever saw about chat GPT and AI and inference is better than training, blah, 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 blah. The real action is reasoning. That's complicated. And that's where these GPU clusters are going to come in. That's why Zuckerberg is buying up all the GPUs at Meta because he wants to squirrel away all those resources. So what's going to happen, Dave, is we're going to see another AWS emerge, possibly. It could be Meta or AWS with Anthropic. They're already making that bet hard. You've seen them you know, deploy the capital. So you, the infrastructure for AI is really the battle royale right now. And it's super exciting because the developers are, are, are hungry. I mean, everybody's yeah. moving to AI, everybody, consumers, yeah. developers, every single industry, every single company wants AI and they can't build out the infrastructure fast enough right now. AWS, AWS would be the next AWS you're saying, but so it, yes. And I well, agree they're with trying. You. Well, they, they could, they're at risk. I mean, they could. Well, before we go there, I agree with you what you're saying about Jensen, but Databricks seems to be doing the opposite. It's like, we want fast outputs. We know that's a problem. And so we're going to make it easy for people to get fast outputs, bring your data, bring your ML, bring your, yeah. your Gen AI, we'll rag it, we'll vector, vectorize it, uh, we'll get, we'll API it, we'll give you model optionality, do well, it that's, all. That, that's because that's where the action is right now. Right now, the well, action so for, for I, developers I, is get your data going. But right. it's a smart, it's a smart play. And, you know, if you can squint through the, the bench marketing, you know, which they love the benchmarks. You remember they in Snowflake used yeah. to go at the urinary Olympics, but uh, so they, you know, that, that works for them. But I, I just, I would caution users to just be careful about the benchmarks. I, I don't think they mean that much because as you pointed out, everybody's leapfrogging each other. Well, I mean, we, we said last year, Google next, that whoever wins the developers in the AI race will, will have a big cloud position because it's going to come down to trust and developers don't want to work with someone who's not going to be innovating. So the leapfrogging will happen. I think that's table stakes and people should expect if you want to be in this business like Databricks and others, the arms race is on and that's just the, the that's the market. So again, the prize is the developer uptake. So, well, and that'll translate directly into software and infrastructure uh, customers. I do want to point out too, and we've talked about this, written about it in breaking analysis quite a bit. There's still a huge gap. When you look at the LLMs that are being adopted, I mean, open AI has a huge lead over virtually everybody, including Llama. Um, and so, but there's a lot of money out there and everybody's going after them, just like everybody's going after NVIDIA. You mentioned this, uh, 
this Intel Samsung Qualcomm thing. Intel's now in both, right? Intel isn't Intel in that AI alliance that Meta and IBM did. So Intel's playing its, you know, its cards in both decks, spreading its which to me, look, if you really want to take it on NVIDIA, don't split, don't fork these alliances. Get together and <laughs> that, let, me ask, I, let me ask you a question. Dave. Let me ask you a question because this has come up this week in our in some of our meetings with people, Dave. This momentum around ecosystem land grabbing is happening. There yeah. seems to be a trend where everyone wants to have their quote AI karitsu, their their crew, their tribe. They want to put together their ecosystem. So you know, as we know in the enterprise, having an ecosystem means you have partners and adoption because it's in, everything's integrated these days. So not having an ecosystem is basically saying we're not relevant. So is there ecosystem washing going on right now? Are people, yes. are, are, people, <laughs> are people standing up kind of ecosystem stories that aren't on solid ground? And, and what's your take on this? And, and, and if so, is that a feature or a bug? Is that just the way it is right now? And, and what will we need to look at to see for a successful ecosystem? Well, I think you're seeing history repeat itself. We saw this in the Unix days, and the remember the original Unix was the original, you know, open systems, right? And you'd have different factions. Remember, digital equipment led one, and the Sun led another one. I can't remember exactly what they were, and you know, they had, they ended up all going to Linux, right? I mean, which is the true <laughs> open source. And so, I think you see this yeah. all, all the time. These these cobbles do form, and these these. Karitsu's form and some of them make it, some of them don't. I guess my point is right now, everybody's going after NVIDIA. NVIDIA's got the, the mantle. They got the, the margins. Your margin is my opportunity. You know, that's saying, but so it's kind of surprised me that these guys would fork it. And I guess they do it because you've got founding members and you've got, you know, laggards who come in later and they don't maybe have as much influence, but I don't know. You look at, look at like what the CNCF has done. I mean, that's worked. Yeah. I mean, right. like that, I mean, you know, in, in every, in every, well, margin, your margin is my opportunity is the basis line, but I think it's more of in any, you know, you learn this in business school, you know, any, anytime there's a market, the barriers to entry are, and there's a key variable in assessing competitive advantage. And certainly NVIDIA has got a huge uh, bar, a barrier to enter. So they got the, the product, they got the software. We call it the moat. So anything that could increase the, the ladder to get into the market. And I think the plot to break up NVIDIA's grip on the AI software business and hardware is to try to put an industry in a group together to have some sort of unified acceleration layer. Um, it would be the equivalent of, to put our historian hat on, to saying IBM and owns the systems network architecture operating system, the network operating system for proprietary mainframes. And let's create the OSI model, TCP, IP, Ethernet. And I think you're seeing another kind of situation lining up where NVIDIA is kind of like the monolithic mainframe. They even use that word in the, in the event, but it's not proprietary as a vendor. But they do have a lock on the operating model with just the inherent barriers to entry. So in a way, there is a lock spec. It's called scale and software. So how do you break that? Open standards. Now, the, only, the only way to connect that and try to get as much momentum. And of course, NVIDIA will try to extend their lead during their time of prosperity by cutting deals with the metas of the world and Amazon's to have product constraints and control the supply. So the Unified Acceleration Foundation, the uh, UXL, is a great initiative on paper <laughs> to do that. But you know, Dave, we've seen the movie before where you can prop up these quote, standards bodies. Sometimes that dog doesn't hunt. And so we'll see. I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see. And by the way, do companies even have the time to participate in this? So, so my 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 one API view on this is that I'm not sure I buy that. I think right now it's who's got the tools, and de facto is more important than you know standing up and holding hands in public. But I think open source so wait, is a big so, driver. So, so what are you saying? I mean, you you think that what Intel, Samsung, Qualcomm are doing in addition to what IBM and Meta did with the AI Alliance, is it you're saying that's good because let a thousand flowers bloom? Or do you, do you think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not hardcore about this, but it just seems to me if, if NVIDIA is the target, which it, we know it is, mm -hmm. yep. why not just bring all those resources together and say, okay, we're going open. Cause that, cause collectively that's the only way we're ever going to catch up to NVIDIA because they have such a huge moat and we'll, 
Yeah, you know, I, know, I have no problem with that. I mean, I'm just saying, it's like, again, if alliances have to be functional to work, like I've seen many alliances that look good on paper, but the market is so focused on other things that the, there's no time to make the alliance work. If the market Barney changes... Alliance. Well, one, there's a couple of factors. One, do they truly commit to the alliance? That's one. Two, is the market moving too fast for the alliance to even get their, their eyes on the beachhead to be secure? So that's going to be another one. If they're motivated by the fact that they're together they're winning together, then that's something that could work. That's how OSI happened. The Open Systems Interconnect, the OSI seven-layer stack, worked um, because the people were highly motivated. Open standards of distributed computing, but the, the full stack wasn't standardized. There's only up to layer, I think four or five, which really got the most traction. Layers one through three were clearly standard. And that's why that's, that's, that's how we got that's how we got internetworking and spine and leaf is, is a critical um rack and stack uh, topology. What what was the target back then? Was it SNA? IBM SNA? And De uh, DECnet SNA and the whole mini computer um, um and proprietary operating systems of uh, Unix. Unix, Unix systems and proprietary network operating systems. They control the physical layer up to switching and uh, transport. So, you know, layer two, layer the, three. Which was essentially the mainframe. Many computers are basically small mainframes. Yeah, I mean, Cisco, Cisco, Cisco became a company because of open standards. And they once they locked in, you had routing, you had layers two and three, you had switching and routing. It was your gold, you're done, off to the races. Now you can connect buildings together and not get locked into the proprietary mainframe um ibm or DEC, which by the way if you had ibm you couldn't run DEC. so it's like a proprietary didn't op interoperate so interoperability was the big thing so we'll, i mean we'll see i mean i don't want to get into a rat hole but but to me no, i just uh, i'm trying to do a uh, historical you know well, compare it, it, it comes down to money right at the end of the day if there's a shortage of gpus and the, the main supplier nvidia is controlling them and a lot of the big hyperscalers control the inventory because they have the, the customers that's going to create market opportunity for uh, capitalism. It's like, hey, there's, there's a market. And if you got developers, which is really strong right now, you got developers building apps and you got entrepreneurs and motivated suppliers to create an alternative, then you got competition. That's a good thing. And I think that's natural and that's uh, the benefit of capitalism. And I think that for that reason, it's not bad to form it. Let's just see if that dog will hunt. And like I said, if the market's moving too fast, that's a challenge. And if people aren't playing uh, together in the sandbox properly, then that could be dysfunctional. So those are the two areas that we're going to watch closely. So what do you think of the Reddit IPO? It was hot, rock, rocketed up, kind of pulling back a little bit. I love back to earth. First of all, I love the fact that Reddit was a great company and form. Um, love the founders, love the whole story, love why it exists. Um, I think it was a great IPO, even though they have no revenue, it's a power dynamic that has all the elements of, of going big. It has a huge audience. Now let's not forget the GameStop generation, right? So like there's plenty of people to activate that stock. So it's got built in power dynamics in the customer base. Love that piece of it. Cause that brings that whole new vibe in there. And, and it has the opportunity potentially to monetize given the scale of the audience. So a huge fan of what Reddit's doing. Love the fact that it went public. Um, it also shows that the IPO market might be opening up, which is a great sign because, you know, the, I think the um, the stock market S and P hit an all time high yesterday, uh, which is interesting. And just again, it's weird how this market is. You have startups falling out of the sky, but you know you got massive economic engine again. The productivity piece is coming in, so I just think it's going to be a good IPO years coming. But I don't, I don't think we're going to have a dark time. I think it, it might be dark for some companies on the wrong side of history, but. I think the Reddit IPO, if the election doesn't screw everything up, then maybe we have a window here. So this could change a lot, you know, a lot of, a lot of activities. Yeah, I'd like to see Databricks go, you know, dying to see those guys go public. Arctic Wolf is another one. I, two years ago, I predicted they were, I think in 2021, I said they'd go public, but uh, kind of missed that one. But I think that's another company that could go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're they're going to line up. I mean, there's got to be a big pipeline of companies that want to go public. Cohesity is another one, you know, that with the with the Veritas acquisition or merger, or that's called. I mean, Sanjay definitely wants to take that company public. So, you know, do, do you do you have to be, you, you know, a billion? You know, can you go with a half a billion, mm -hmm. ARR or even revenue? Right? Do you have to be a billion dollar company now? Remember, it used to be a hundred million. Yeah, you had to have a hundred million to do IPO. <laughs> and 
Now is it a billion? Is it a 10x in this I, AI? I, I, I think I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a um, uh, a fundamental change in how people are. The zero interest rate period is over. I think you're going to see a more pragmatic entrepreneurial story coming public. I think you're going to see real growth companies. There'll be some hypes out there on the AI side, but I think in the next 18 months, we're going to figure that out. Sure. But like in general, the, the vibe here in Silicon Valley is if you can't run a business and th think like get customers and at least have a, a strategy. If you're going to go for the growth, you better not just think of it like it's free money. You got to work on the fundamentals on the go to market aspect of the product market fit. I think that's the big observation that's happening here is, is that if you're in a series uh, a or or later, series A, B, or C, if you don't have like a solid field, go-to-market growth plan, then that's not going to fly. You won't get funded. So um, that those those days of having that, not not having that in place are over. That means are, you're going to be more fundamental when you go public. People are obviously freaked out about interest rates, 5% interest rates. But you remember, during the dot-com run-up from whatever, 96, 97, 98, 99, even into 2000, interest rates were 7 to 8%. Now, the difference was the Clinton administration who raised taxes were paying down debt. They were, you know, but they, they actually, I think, balanced mm -hmm. the budget for one or two years. Yeah. So now the difference is you got this massive $33, $34 trillion debt, and you're paying, you know, huge debt service. So that's the difference that compresses sort of the enthusiasm, you know, rightfully. Mm -hmm. So I think that has to be addressed. And of course, nobody's talking about it. And I don't really want to get into it, but that's kind of not the focus of our cube pod. We like to talk tech, but yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, so we, I mean, we have a lot of, uh, you know, Adobe had their conference this week and you know, they had that big blowout with Figment acquisition didn't go through. They're talking about gender of AI. You have this whole I was invited to that, but I I couldn't go. I wanted to go. I, I really like Adobe. I like what they're doing in AI. I think they're applying AI very intelligently. I heard the conference was was really strong. Um I know I was talking to Andy Tarai. He he was he said it was pretty good. Um it was good. So. I followed the whole event. It was great. Um followed all the uh, the keynotes, followed all the tweets. Uh, I obviously didn't want to go to Vegas, so I tapped out. Um, but we did cover it. We had other Cube alumni there. We had Cube Collective. Reese was there. We have a whole analysis piece coming out. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think Adobe's really, they're trying hard. I mean, it was a good event, I'm sure, but because they have a good product. But Adobe's in the crosshairs right now. I think there, uh, Dave, they had the big Figma deal went south on it. Remember that? So, yeah, I do. I, I almost think that was a blessing in disguise, though. Well, I mean, let's, I mean, we'll see if they can, you know, cross the chasm. I mean, you know, the, 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 there was a joint decision to end the merger. Remember that? That was that's what I know. I, I felt like that. Remember the 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 Figma deal was announced was consummated really prior to the Chat GPT hype. Yeah. And I think uh, I think there was a period where they they <laughs> that the that Figma wasn't worth what yeah. Adobe was offering. So I, I don't know. I, I think it'll I, there was there was regulatory issues big time. So for sure. And so yeah. that's why they both said, all right, forget it. Let's tap out. But uh yeah. I mean Lena's at it again. I think Adobe with their assets could be a great gen AI company. Uh the question is, do they have the culture? That's what I was looking at and trying to read through the tea leaves there. Um, not sure yet how I feel about it. I'm more more to dig in on that. But yeah, all good. Uh and also, you know, so the big news on um the crypto exchange king, Sam. Bankman for you think about that years. You think that was uh you think that was the right call? I mean to to put him away for that long? I mean, not not that I'm sympathetic to Sam Bankman Freed, but you know, I think this I think reasonable people could say, well, you know, it's a it's a moment in time where you say, Hey, you know, this is not how we do business. But my my thinking is that they probably gave him the sentence and making he'll uh, peel out something will go downstream but it sends a message if you're a crypto bro and you're thinking about taking a shortcut you know don't fuck over people like he did i mean he, he basically didn't admit any wrongdoing but you know he uh he'll be out in 2048 dave i think I, I, a lot <laughs> of that was showed i mean he took the stand he really showed no remorse he's kind of a weird dude you know, people say he's on the spectrum. 
Um, so that couldn't have helped him. The, the tweets were pretty hilarious. SBF going to hold H O L D in jail. Oh, going to hold. He's going. He's hold. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Which is for those of you who don't know, it's like the it's like the he's crypto gonna, gonna, hold. Don't someone, sell. Hold. Someone else. Someone else. Wrote, SBF is going to come out of prison firing in all cylinders on the Web Five. <laughs> oh, that's brutal. Yeah. Uh, say, it's, it's, you know, the entertainment is strong on this um tweet streams so but i mean you know didn't i mean I, I know people's money was frozen for a while but didn't didn't people get their money back eventually i mean i know they could have sold and the money was locked up and i'm sure that that affected a lot, a lot of people i think would you know i think what madoff did was well sam bankman fried was pretty pretty bad what he did but the outcomes for people with madoff were a lot worse and they, and apparently it, anthropic, anthropic investments doing extremely well yeah yeah, yeah there you go right he hit to sell that off so yeah. well, right he had assets he could liquidate and people got their money back or at least you know well i guess you could say that they would make a lot more now with crypto rising the way it has but i don't know it's a philosophical question, but he got what well, he got, deserved it. So. Not to change topics, but I, I do want to get your thoughts because I just finished watching the Apple um, Dynasty about the Patriots. And uh, yeah, I watched you, that. Did, have you seen that yet? I have. What do you think about it? Did you think Belichick was? Uh, I thought know, it was a Belichick hit piece. You know, he I went think after him hard. I mean, it's it's a, isn't it? Wasn't it a craft production? I was surprised, John, that the players like Matthew Slater kind of threw Belichick under the bus. I wasn't surprised that Amendola, Amendola didn't like Belichick. Um, but I thought Matthew Slater, who was the captain of the team, and he really kind of threw Belichick under the bus. They made Belichick look really bad. I think people forget how, the great things that Belichick did. Yeah, they made him look like a total tool. The way his camera angles were, he was like leaning back, like looking, looking fat and evil, like he was like this. And so, and, and was... Like he's an old school coach, not in touch with the players. Brady's the king of all things, and you know. And so, what I didn't know, what what I didn't know because I wasn't living there, because you were close to that. I didn't know how it was unraveling so much earlier in in the process. I had no idea that Belichick really didn't want him around with the Garoppolo tire. So yeah. I had I, no idea that was the case there. So that's, that's, that's the amazing thing about, you know, Brady, a couple of amazing things. I mean, first of all, don't forget if Malcolm Butler doesn't intercept that pass then Brady's just, you know, dynasty over. Right. If, if, uh, uh, that there wasn't that strip sack against Matty ice in Atlanta, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I mean, Football. They had, is, they, they had an onside kick on that game, and also, but by, by the way, what they also highlighted in that thing was the whole Malcolm Butler sitting out in the Super Bowl. Well, and again, that's they—they they really. Hey, I don't forgive uh, Belichick for that. He, he had did. his reasons. He didn't answer it. He was sort of all well, I've I've answered that. I mean, he they really made him look like a tool. But you got to remember too, all that stuff's edited, so it was easy to make him look like a tool. He, it he, it, he it was a Brady himself. Brady but, left piece for sure. But but, I mean. It was also interesting, Kraft saying the reason he kept Belichick was the masterful defensive scheme he did against uh, L.A. that year, uh, the Rams. And by the way, the Rams were a better team. They had a better offense and a better defense. And he outcoached, uh, what's his name, the young guy. I mean, um, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're the, if you're the owner, you keep Belichick, right? I mean – I mean that's a it's a tough I and mean, he he did have to hold them together but at some point you got to keep the coach. Well, in retrospect, no, but yeah, I mean I don't think I think at the time and I'll tell you the sentiment around this region at the time was okay, let Brady go. They people were kind of pissed at Brady for leaving. And so, you know, a lot of people say, "Ah, he's dead to me." And then of course he just goes and wins the Super Bowl with Tampa yeah. Bay. That, that was, was that amazing. was that was a dagger. But I mean, the first three Super Bowls. I mean, Brady's amazing, right? But I mean, talk about team, though. I mean that that team with Brewski and 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 uh, Willie McGinnis and and those guys, Troy Brown. I mean, a consummate team. Remember first Super Bowl choosing to be introduced as a team. Mm -hmm. So and and Belichick, they bought into Belichick, and I think the last few years 
the young kids didn't. They were like, screw this guy. He's old. He's out of touch. But I, I thought it was unfair. I, I, I thought they they didn't do a really good job of talking about the dynasty. It was all yeah. about deflate gate and spy gate and you know all that other nonsense that was, you know, okay, they did it, whatever. But that, that's but that's not why that team won. They, the team won because it was a consummate team. Everybody bought in. Belichick was an awesome coach. He had great coaches around him um, that bought into his system. Of course, they never became much outside of his system. But anyway, it's a shame to see Belichick, you know, I don't know. I think he's put his yeah. um, greatest coach of all time um, at risk these yeah, last I, weeks. I think they could have done a better job. Belichick did get slammed. All right. Well, we got the big NCAA brackets. How you? How's your brackets, Dave? Oh, I, I had Kentucky back. going all the way. They lost in the first round to Oakland. I mean, I'm like, I'm <laughs> at school. <laughs> <laughs> the Kansas loss was a big one for me. Um, yeah, that was. I, I'm rooting for the Carolina because Caroline, my daughter, is a senior at UNC. They made it to the final game two years ago. Didn't even make the NCAA last year. Um, NC State. I had. I, I should have picked them because I my hunch was to pick them to the final four because they were hot. They won the five straight games in the ACC. They were on fire. They, they love how they just got into that last game, uh, beat Oakland. It was really awesome. So we'll see how they do against Marquette. Um, Houston, I got Houston going going deep. I had Houston going to the final four. Yeah, and, me too. And, and I have Purdue going there too so gonzaga purdue is going to go down so we'll see i think nc state is going to have a good ride in we'll see how arizona does they're a wild card now caleb love on arizona used to play for unc i don't know if you know this but he left the team because he got into a scuffle with the uh, rj davis they were going after he went after rj davis's girlfriend and uh there was a huge locker room problem at unc around this whole issue so they had he had to leave the team so or Left the team on that on that. That's why they had a terrible year last year. Huge dynamic. Caleb Love was a great player, but I I had just, it, you can't go after the same. You can't go after your teammate's girlfriend. That's like code. Oh right, but, yeah. Yeah, this is, that is I think code. That, do you think that would cause locker room problems, Dave? You think that's going to cause locker room problems? Oh my god, right? Right? Yeah. that's that's uh, crossing the line. You know, that's crossing the line. That's big time problem. Team, right? I mean, you just don't do that to bros. I had Arizona because my daughter went there, so I, you know, I like Arizona. I, <laughs> my one had one daughter went to Ole Miss, so I always root for them. And and uh, not that they were in this tournament, but football, they had a good football season. And Arizona, you know, go U of A, bear down. So, so you got NC State and UNC. We got speaking of North Carolina, we got SAS Innovation uh, uh, Innovate event coming up in, at the Aria Hotel next month, the week after Google Next. Uh, they're in Cary, North Carolina. What a great private company SAS is. Last year was our first time going to SAS Innovate. It was killer. We got MongoDB Local on May 2nd. I got my, I have two kids graduated from college, Tyler and Caroline, Northeastern and UNC. We got the Red Hat Summit, Boomy World, um, um, Alteryx in Vegas. Dell Tech World. Dell Tech World, Informatica World, IBM Think, Cisco Live, Snowflake, Click. Databricks, HP Discover, HP Discover. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, it's going to be a, a fun run. Crowd strike. Like, all... Let me ask you a question, Dave. What are you looking for in the next few months as we look at the research? I saw your research agenda we're publishing on the Cube. By the way, great job on the Cube research, uh, publishing that that agenda, uh, research agenda. But what are you what are we what are you looking at? What are we going to be talking about over the next few months? I mean, the real the thing that I'm looking at is, and I said in my predictions. You know, AI has to be, 2024 has to be the year of AI ROI, or it's going to constrict funding. And I think what I'm seeing in the data is that expectations for ROI are getting pushed. The macro, the spending is getting pushed into the second half. So I think people are, you know, realizing they're getting a reality check. If you look at what they're doing with generative AI, it's pretty basic. I mean, it's amazing, but it's really not game changing yet. You hear some pockets of productivity boost and I think the potential is there, but in terms of the real dollars that are going to loosen up the CFO purse strings, that's not happening yet. It's getting pushed out and I think I think it's going to be a 2025 and even 2026 story that this thing really kicks in. And I think the big question is, okay, everybody wants to know when does the bubble burst? Is it like the dot com? And I think because funding levels are so much higher here, you know, we may we may get a soft landing for the AI bubble burst. We, 
it may not be that bad. We may hit productivity, you know, and the bubble bursting may not be as painful as it was in the past. At least I hope that's the case. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it's uh, opening day in the MLB um, today. So you got uh, Major League Baseball kicking off, March Madness, we got the Cube season kicking in. Uh, the Cube community is is doing great. Want to have a shout out to our 14th year doing the Cube. Um, I can't believe it's been 14 years and uh, a lot of still fun going on. And and uh, we got the Red Sox tickets this year again, right? We do. Baseball in March. It's crazy. We got a bunch of, bunch of tickets this year. We is it like, is it early for baseball? It's early. It's definitely early. And the Red Sox haven't done much on the offseason. I'm really kind of disappointed. It's like two years in a row. They really have just. Is that like, home game or is that is that Seattle? Yeah, they don't. Nothing home in March. The first home games in April. Opening so they're, days. They're in Seattle. Too All right. Well, Dave, we're, we'll call it a day. I know you wanted to take Good Fridays, do the Stasis of the Cross, um, and uh, Devers hit a solo home run. Red Sox got a one nothing lead. Sitting, <laughs> streaming right you know, now. This <laughs> when you know, like two, <laughs> I think it was uh, 2013. I think they were not not project. They were projected to be last, and they ended up winning the World Series. So you never know. <laughs> you Baseball. never know. All right. Well, Dave, have a great uh, weekend and a uh, great pod. 52, one, one year in. Um, I got to say, I think um, I like the feedback we're getting from people. I got a great hat tip from uh, a financial analyst and Bloomberg and a bunch of other folks on our pod. They love the deep dive. So we'll continue to do deep dive, bring in some guests next year. But have a great weekend. All right. Thanks, John. You too. Keep 52 in the books. Thanks for listening, everyone. Go to siliconangle.com, thecube.net. Check out the Cube Research. Dot com, a new site we just converted over from wikibon.com. That's all the research. That's the heavy lifting content. See you next time.